Section three of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one The Calvinist Martyr. Chapter one A House Which No Longer Exists. At the corner of a street which no longer exists, in a Paris which no longer exists. Few persons in the present day know how plain and unpretentious were the dwellings of the burghers of Paris in the 16th century, and how simple their lives. Perhaps this simplicity of habits and thought was the cause of the grandeur of that old bourgeoisie which was certainly grand, free, and noble, or so perhaps than the bourgeoisie of the present day. Its history is still to be written. It requires and it awaits a man of genius. This reflection will doubtless rise to the lips of every one after reading the almost unknown incident which forms the basis of this study, and is one of the most remarkable facts in the history of that bourgeoisie. It will not be the first time in history that conclusion has preceded facts. In 1560, the houses of the Rue de la Vielle Pelleterie skirted the left bank of the Seine between the Pont Notre Dame and the Pont au Change. A public footpath and the houses then occupied the space covered by a present roadway. Each house standing almost in the river allowed its dwellers to get down to the water by stone or wooden stairways, closed and protected by strong iron railings or wooden gates clamped with iron. The houses, like those in Venice, had an entrance on terra firma and a water entrance. At the moment when the present sketch is published, only one of these houses remains to recall the old Paris of which we speak, and that is soon to disappear. It stands at the corner of the Petit Pont, directly opposite to the guardhouse of the Hôtel Dieu. Formerly, each dwelling presented on the riverside the fantastic appearance given either by the trade of its occupant and his habits, or by the originality of the exterior constructions invented by the proprietors to use or abuse the Seine the bridges being encumbered with more mills than the necessities of navigation could allow the seine formed as many enclosed basins as there were bridges some of these basins in the heart of old paris would have offered precious stones and tones of colour to painters what a forest of cross-beams supported the mills with their huge sails and their wheels what strange effects were produced by the piles or props driven into the water to project the upper floors of the houses above the stream unfortunately the art of genre painting did not exist in those days and that of engraving was in its infancy we have therefore lost that curious spectacle still offered though in miniature by certain provincial towns where the rivers are overhung with wooden houses and where as at vendome the basins full of water grasses are enclosed by immense iron railings to isolate each proprietor's share of the stream which extends from bank to bank the name of this street, which has now disappeared from the map, sufficiently indicates the trade that was carried on in it. In those days the merchants of each class of commerce, instead of dispersing themselves about the city, kept together in the same neighbourhood, and protected themselves mutually. Associated in corporations which limited their number, they were still further united into guilds by the church. In this way, prices were maintained. Also, the masters were not at the mercy of their workmen, who did not obey their whims as they do today. On the contrary, they made them their children, their apprentices, took care of them, and taught them the intricacies of the trade. In order to become a master, a workman had to produce a masterpiece, which was always dedicated to the saint of his guild. Would any one dare to say that the absence of competition destroyed the desire for perfection, or lessened the beauty of products? What say you? you whose admiration for the masterpieces of past ages has created the modern trade of the sellers of bric-a-brac in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries the trade of the furrier was one of the most flourishing industries the difficulty of obtaining furs which being all brought from the north required long and perilous journeys gave a very high price and value to those products then as now high prices led to consumption for vanity likes to override obstacles in France, as in other kingdoms, not only did royal ordinances restrict the use of furs to the nobility, proved by the part which ermine plays in the old blazons, but also certain rare furs, such as vaire, which was undoubtedly Siberian sable, 
could not be worn by any but kings, dukes, and certain lords clothed with official powers. A distinction was made between the greater and lesser vayer. The very name has been so long disused that in a vast number of editions of Perrault's famous tale, Cinderella's Slipper, which was no doubt of vayer, the fur, is said to have been made of vair, glass. Lately, one of our most distinguished poets was obliged to establish the true orthography of the word for the instruction of his brother Fuitonists in giving an account of the opera of the Senen Rontela, where the symbolic slipper has been replaced by a ring, which symbolizes nothing at all. Naturally, the sumptuary laws about the wearing of fur were perpetually infringed upon, to the great satisfaction of the furriers. The costliness of stuffs and furs made a garment in those days a durable thing, as lasting as the furniture, the armour, and other items of that strong life of the fifteenth century. A woman of rank, a seigneur, all rich men, also all the burghers, possessed at the most two garments for each season, which lasted their lifetime and beyond it. These garments were bequeathed to their children. Consequently, the clause in the marriage contract relating to arms and clothes, which in these days is almost a dead letter because of the small value of wardrobes that need constant renewing, was then of much importance. Great costs brought with them solidity. The toilet of a woman constituted a large capital. It was reckoned among the family possessions, and was kept in those enormous chests which threatened to break through the floors of our modern houses. The jewels of a woman of 1840 would have been the undress ornaments of a great lady in 1540. Today the discovery of America, the facilities of transportation, the ruin of social distinctions which has paved the way for the ruin of apparent distinctions, has reduced the trade of the furrier to what it now is, next to nothing. The article which a furrier sells today is in former days for 20 livres has followed the depreciation of money, formerly the livre which is now worth one franc, and is usually so called, was worth twenty francs. Today, the lesser bourgeoisie and the courtesans who edge their capes with sable are ignorant that in 1440 an ill-disposed police officer would have incontinently arrested them and marched them before the justice at the Châtelet. English women, who are so fond of them, do not know that in former times none but queens, duchesses, and chancellors were allowed to wear that royal fur. There are today in France several ennobled families whose true name is Pelletier or Le Pelletier, the origin of which is evidently derived from some rich furrier's counter, for most of our burghers' names began in some such way. This digression will explain not only the long feud as to the precedence which the Guild of Drapers maintained for two centuries against the Guild of Furriers, and also of Mercers, each claiming the right to walk first as being the most important guild in Paris, but it will also serve to explain the importance of the Sieur Le Camus, a furrier honoured with the custom of two queens, Catherine de' Medici and Mary Stuart, also the custom of the Parliament, a man who for twenty years was the syndic of his corporation and who lived in the street we have just described. The house of Lecamus was one of three which formed to the three angles of the open space at the end of the Pont au Change, where nothing now remains but the tower of the Palais de Justice, which made the fourth angle. On the corner of this house, which stood at the angle of the Pont au Change and the Caille, now called the Caille aux Fleurs, the architect had constructed a little shrine for a Madonna, which was always lighted by wax tapers and decked with real flowers in summer and artificial ones in winter. On the side of the house toward the Rue du Pont, as on the side toward the Rue de la Vielle Pelleterie, the upper story of the house was supported by wooden pillars. All the houses in this mercantile quarter had an arcade behind these pillars, where the passers in the street walked under cover on a ground of trodden mud, which kept the place always dirty. In all French towns, these arcades or galleries are called les pillières a general term to which was added the name of the business transacted under them, as Pilier des Halles, markets, Pilier de la Boucherie, butchers. These galleries, a necessity in a Parisian climate, which is so changeable and so rainy, gave this part of the city a peculiar character of its own, but they have now disappeared. Not a single house on the river bank remains, and not more than about a hundred feet of the old Pilier des Halles, the last that have resisted the action of time, are left 
and before long even that relic of the sombre labyrinth of old Paris will be demolished. Certainly the existence of such old ruins of the Middle Ages is incompatible with the grandeurs of modern Paris. These observations are meant not so much to regret the destruction of the old town as to preserve in words and by the history of those who lived there the memory of a place now turned to dust, and to excuse the following description which may be precious to a future age now treading on the heels of our own. The walls of this house were of wood covered with slate. The spaces between the uprights had been filled in, as we may still see in some provincial towns, with brick, so placed by reversing their thickness as to make a pattern called Hungarian point. The window casings and lintels, also in wood, were richly carved, and so was the corner pillar, where it rose above the shrine of the Madonna, and all the other pillars in front of the house. Each window and each main beam which separated the different stories was covered with arabesques of fantastic personages and animals, wreathed with conventional foliage. On the street side, as on the river side, the house was capped with a roof, looking as if two cards were set up one against the other, thus presenting a gable to the street and a gable to the water. This roof, like the roof of a Swiss chalet, overhung the building so far that on the second floor there was an outside gallery with a balustrade on which the owners of the house could walk under cover and survey the street. Also the river basin between the bridges and the two lines of houses. These houses on the river bank were very valuable. In those days, a system of drains and fountains was still to be invented. Nothing of the kind as yet existed except the circuit sewer constructed by Aubureau, provost of Paris under Charles the Wise, who also built the Bastille, the Pont Saint Michel, and other bridges, and was the first man of genius who ever thought of the sanitary improvement of Paris. The houses situated like that of Lecamus took from the river the water necessary for the purposes of life and also made the river serve as a natural drain for rainwater and household refuse. The great works that the merchants' provosts did in this direction are fast disappearing. Middle-aged persons alone can remember to have seen the great holes in the Rue Montmartre, Rue du Temple, etc., down which the waters poured. Those terrible open doors were in the olden time of immense benefit to Paris. Their place will probably be forever marked by the sudden rise of the paved roadways at the spots where they opened, another archaeological detail which would be quite inexplicable to the historian two centuries hence. One day, about 1816, a little girl who was carrying a case of diamonds to an actress at the Ombigu for her part as queen was overtaken by a shower and so nearly washed down the great drain hole in the Rue du Temple that she would have disappeared had it not been for a passer who heard her cries. Unluckily, she had let go the diamonds, which were, however, recovered later at a manhole. This event made a great noise and gave rise to many petitions against these engulfers of water and little girls. They were singular constructions about five feet high, furnished with iron railings, more or less movable, which often caused the inundation of the neighbouring cellars, whenever the artificial river produced by sudden rains was arrested in its course by the filth and refuse collected about these railings, which the owners of the abutting houses sometimes forget to open. The front of this shop of the Sieur Lacamus was all window, formed of sashes of leaded panes which made the interior very dark. The furs were taken for selection to the houses of rich customers. As for those who came to the shop to buy, the goods were shown to them outside, between the pillars, the arcade being, let us remark, encumbered during the daytime with tables and clerks sitting on stools, such as we all remember seeing some fifteen years ago under the Pilier des Halles. From these outposts the clerks and apprentices talked, questioned, answered each other, and called to the passers, customs which the great Walter Scott has made use of in his fortunes of Nigel. The sign which represented an ermine hung outside, as we still see in some village hostelries from a rich bracket of gilded iron filigree. Above the ermine on one side of the sign were the words Le Camus Furrier To Madame La Roine et du Roy Nostra Sire. On the other hand of the sign were the words To Madame La Roine Mere and Messieurs du Parlement. The words Madame la Roine Mère had been lately added. The gilding was fresh. This addition showed the recent changes produced by the sudden and violent death of Henri II, which overturned many fortunes at court and began that of the Guises. The back shop opened on the river. In this room usually sat the respectable proprietor himself and Mademoiselle Lacamus. 
In those days, the wife of a man who was not noble had no right to the title of dame, madame, but the wives of the burghers of Paris were allowed to use that of mademoiselle. In virtue of privileges granted and confirmed to their husbands by the several kings to whom they had done service. Between this back shop and the main shop was the well of a corkscrew staircase, which gave access to the upper story, where were the great ware room and the dwelling rooms of the old couple, and the garrets lighted by skylights, where slept the children, the servant women, the apprentices, and the clerks. This crowding of families, servants, and apprentices, the little space which each took up in the building where the apprentices all slept in one large chamber under the roof, explains the enormous population of Paris, then agglomerated on one-tenth of the surface of the present city, also the queer details of private life in the Middle Ages, also the contrivances of love, which with all due deference to historians are found only in the pages of the romance writers, without whom they would be lost to the world. At this period, very great seigneurs, such, for instance, as Admiral de Coligny, occupied three rooms, and their suites lived at some neighbouring inn. There were not in those days more than fifty private mansions in Paris, and those were filthy palaces belonging to sovereign princes or to great vassals whose way of living was superior to that of the greatest German rulers, such as the Duke of Bavaria and the Elector of Saxony. The kitchen of the Lecamus family was beneath the back shop and looked out upon the river. It had a glass door opening upon a sort of iron balcony from which the cook drew up water in a bucket, and where the household washing was done. The back shop was made the dining room, office, and salon of the merchant. In this important room, in all such houses richly panelled and adorned with some special work of art, and also a carved chest, the life of the merchant was passed. There the joyous suppers after the work of the day was over. There the secret conferences on the political interests of the burghers and of royalty took place. The formidable corporations of Paris were at that time able to arm a hundred thousand men. Therefore the opinions of the merchants were backed by their servants, their clerks, their apprentices, their workmen. The burghers had a chief in the provost of the merchants who commanded them, and in the Hôtel de Ville, a palace where they possessed the right to assemble. In the famous burghers' parlour, their solemn deliberations took place. Had it not been for the continual sacrifices which by that time made war intolerable to the corporations who were weary of their losses and of the famine, on Louis the Fourth, that factionist who became king might never perhaps have entered Paris. Everyone can now picture to himself the appearance of this corner of old Paris, where the bridge and Cai still are, where the trees of the Cai aux Fleurs now stand, and where no trace remains of the period of which we write except the tall and famous tower of the Palais de Justice from which the signal was given for the saint Bartholomew, strange circumstance. One of the houses standing at the foot of that tower, then surrounded by wooden shops, that namely of Le Camus, which was about to witness the birth of facts which were destined to prepare for that night of massacre, which was unhappily more favourable than fatal to Calvinism. At the moment when our history begins, the audacity of the new religious doctrines was pulling all Paris in a ferment. A Scotchman named Stuart, had just assassinated President Minard, the member of the Parliament to whom public opinion attributed the largest share in the execution of Councillor Anne de Bourg, who was burned on the Place de Grève after the King's tailor, to whom Henri the Second and Diane de Poitiers had caused the torture of the question to be applied in their very presence. Paris was so closely watched that the archers compelled all passers along the street to pray before the shrines of the Madonna so as to discover heretics by their unwillingness or even refusal to do an act contrary to their beliefs. The two archers who were stationed at the corner of the Lecamu house had departed, and Christophe, son of the furrier, vehemently suspected of deserting Catholicism, was able to leave the shop without fear of being made to adore the Virgin. By seven in the evening, in April 1560, darkness was already falling, and the apprentices, seeing no signs of customers on either side of the arcade, were beginning to take in the merchandise exposed as samples beneath the pillars in order to close the shop. Christophe Le Camus, an ardent young man about twenty-two years old, was standing on the sill of the shop door, apparently watching the apprentices. Monsieur, said one of them, addressing Christophe, and pointing to a man who was walking to and fro under the gallery with an air of indecision. Perhaps that's a thief or a spy. Anyhow, the shabby wretch can't be an honest man. If he wanted to speak to us, he would come over frankly, instead of sidling along as he does. And what a face, continued the apprentice, mimicking the man, with his nose and his cloak, his yellow eyes and that famished look. 
When the stranger thus described caught sight of Christophe alone on the door sill, he suddenly left the opposite gallery where he was then walking, crossed the street rapidly, and came under the arcade in front of the Lecamu house. There he passed slowly along in front of the shop, and before the apprentices returned to close the outer shutters, he said to Christophe in a low voice, I am should you. Hearing the name of one of the most illustrious ministers and devoted actors in a terrible drama called The Reformation, Christophe quivered as a faithful peasant might have quivered on recognizing his disguised king. Perhaps you would like to see some furs. Though it is almost dark, I will show you some myself, said Christophe, wishing to throw the apprentices, whom he had heard behind him, off the scent. With a wave of his hand, he invited the minister to enter the shop, but the latter replied that he preferred to converse outside. Christophe then fetched his cap and followed the disciple of Calvin. Though banished by an edict, Chaudieu, the secret envoy of Théodore de Bez and Calvin, who were directing the French Reformation from Geneva, went and came, risking the cruel punishment to which the Parliament, in unison with the Church and royalty, had condemned one of their number, the celebrated Anne de Bourg, in order to make a terrible example. Chaudieu, whose brother was a captain, and one of Admiral Coligny's best soldiers was a powerful auxiliary, by whose arm Calvin shook France at the beginning of the twenty-two years of religious warfare, now on the point of breaking out. This minister was one of the hidden wheels whose movements can best exhibit the widespread action of the reform. Chaudieu led Christophe to the water's edge through an underground passage, which was like that of the Marion Tunnel, filled up by the authorities about ten years ago. This passage, which was situated between the Le Camus House and the one adjoining it, ran under the Rue de la Vielle Pelletierie, and was called the Pont aux Foreurs. It was used by the dyers of the city to go to the river and wash their flax and silks and other stuffs. A little boat was at the entrance of it, rowed by a single sailor. In the bow was a man unknown to Christophe, a man of low stature and very simply dressed. Chaudieu and Christophe entered the boat, which in a moment was in the middle of the Seine. The sailor then directed its course beneath one of the wooden arches of the Pont au Change, where he tied up quickly to an iron ring. As yet no one had said a word. Here we can speak without fear. There are no traitors or spies here, said Chaudieu, looking at the two as yet unnamed men, and turning an ardent face to Christophe. Are you, he said, full of that devotion that should animate a martyr? Are you ready to endure all for our sacred cause? Do you fear the tortures applied to the consulat de Bourg? To the king's tailor, tortures which await the majority of us. I shall confess the gospel, replied Lecamou, simply looking at the windows of his father's back shop. The family lamp standing on the table where his father was making up his books for the day spoke to him, no doubt of the joys of family and the peaceful existence which he now renounced. The vision was rapid but complete. His mind took in at a glance the burger quarter full of its own harmonies, where his happy childhood had been spent where lived his promised bride, Babette Lallier, where all things promised him a sweet and full existence. He saw the past, he saw the future, and he sacrificed it, or at any rate, he staked it all. Such were the men of that day. You need us no more, said the impetuous sailor. You know him for one of our saints. If the Scotchman had not done the deed, he would kill us that infamous Minard. Yes, said Lecamus. My life belongs to the church. I shall give it with joy for the triumph of the Reformation, on which I have seriously reflected. I know that what we do is for the happiness of the peoples. In two words, popery drives to celibacy. The Reformation establishes the family. It is time to rid France of her monks, to restore their lands to the crown, who will sooner or later sell them to the burghers. Let us learn to die for our children, and to make our families some day free and prosperous. The face of the young enthusiast, that of Chaudieu, that of the sailor, that of the stranger seated in the bow, lighted by the last gleams of the twilight, formed a picture which ought the more to be described, because the description contains in itself the whole history of the times, if it is indeed true that to certain men it is given to sum up in their own persons the spirit of their age. The religious reform undertaken by Luther in Germany, John Knox in Scotland, Calvin in France, took hold especially of those minds in the lower classes into which thought had penetrated. The great lords sustained the movement only to serve interests that were foreign to the religious cause. To these two classes were added adventurers, ruined noblemen, younger sons to whom all troubles were equally acceptable. But among the artisan and merchant classes the new faith was sincere and based on calculation. 
the masses of the poorer people adhered at once to a religion which gave the ecclesiastical property to the state and deprived the dignitaries of the church of their enormous revenues commerce everywhere reckoned up the profits of this religious operation and devoted itself body soul and purse to the cause but among the young men of the french bourgeoisie the protestant movement found that noble inclination to sacrifices of all kinds which inspires youth to which selfishness is as yet unknown eminent men sagacious minds discerned the republic in the reformation they desired to establish throughout europe the government of the united provinces which ended by triumphing over the greatest power of those times spain under philip the second represented in the low countries by the duke of alba john Otterman was then meditating his famous book in which this project is put forth a book which spread throughout france the leaven of these ideas which was stirred up anew by the league represented by richelieu then by louis the fourteenth always protected by the younger branches by the house of orleans in 1789 as by the house of bourbon in 1589 Rousseau says investigate says revolt all revolt is either the cloak that hides a prince or the swaddling clothes of a new mastery the house of bourbon the younger sons of the valois were at work beneath the surface of the reformation at the moment when the little boat floated beneath the arch of the pont au change the question was strangely complicated by the ambitions of the guises who were rivalling the bourbons thus the crown represented by catherine de medici was able to sustain the struggle for thirty years by pitting the one house against the other house whereas later the crown instead of standing between various jealous ambitions found itself without a barrier face to face with the people richelieu and louis the fourteenth had broken down the barrier of nobility louis the fifteenth had broken down that of the parliaments alone before the people as louis the sixteenth was a king must inevitably succumb Christophe Le Camus was a fine representative of the ardent and devoted portion of the people. His one face had the sharp hectic tones which distinguish certain fair complexions. His hair was yellow, of a coppery shade. His grey-blue eyes were sparkling. In them alone was his fine soul visible, for his ill-proportioned face did not atone for its triangular shape by the noble mien of an elevated mind, and his low forehead indicated only extreme energy. Life seemed to centre in his chest, which was rather hollow. More nervous than sanguine, Christophe's bodily appearance was thin and thread-like, but wiry. His pointed nose expressed the shrewdness of the people, and his countenance revealed an intelligence capable of conducting itself well on a single point of the circumference, without having the faculty of seeing all around it. His eyes, the arching brows of which, scarcely covered with a whitish down projected like an awning, were strongly circled by a pale blue band, the skin being white and shining at the spring of the nose a sign which almost always denotes excessive enthusiasm. Christophe was of the people, the people who devote themselves, who fight for their devotions, who let themselves be inveiled and betrayed, intelligent enough to comprehend and serve an idea, too upright to turn it to his own account, too noble to sell themselves. Contrasting with this son of Lecamou, Chaudieu, the ardent minister with brown hair, thinned by vigils, a yellow skin and eloquent mouth, a militant brow with flaming brown eyes and a short and prominent chin embodied well the christian faith which brought to the reformation so many sincere and fanatical pastors whose courage and spirit aroused the populations the aide de camp of calvin and theodore de bez contrasted admirably with the son of the furrier he represented the fiery cause of which the effect was seen in christophe the sailor an impetuous being tanned by the open air accustomed to dewy nights and burning days with closed lips hasty gestures orange eyes ravenous of those of a vulture and black frizzled hair was the embodiment of an adventurer who risks all in a venture as a gambler stakes all on a card his whole appearance revealed terrific passions and an audacity that flinched at nothing his vigorous muscles were made to be quiescent as well as to act his manner was more audacious than noble his nose though thin turned up and snuffed battle he seemed agile and capable would have known him in all ages for the leader of a party. If we were not of the Reformation, he might have been Pizarro, Fernando Cortes, or Morgan the Exterminator, a man of violent action of some kind. The fourth man, sitting on a thwart, wrapped in his cloak, belonged evidently to the highest portion of society. The fineness of his linen, its cut, the material and scent of his clothing, the style and skin of his gloves, showed him to be a man of courts, just as his bearing, his haughtiness, 
his composure and his all-embracing glance prove him to be a man of war. The aspect of this personage made a spectator uneasy in the first place, and then inclined him to respect. We respect a man who respects himself. Though short and deformed, his manners instantly redeemed the disadvantages of his figure. The ice once broken, he showed a lively rapidity of decision, with an indefinable dash and fire which made him seem affable and winning. He had the blue eyes and the curved nose of the House of Navarre, and the Spanish cut of the marked features which were in after days the type of the Bourbon kings. In a word, the scene now assumed a startling interest. Well, said Chaudieu, as young Lecamus ended his speech, this boat man is Le Renaudy, and he is Monseigneur de Prince de Conde, he added, motioning to the deformed little man. Thus these four men represented the faith of the people, the spirit of the scriptures, the mailed hand of the soldier, and royalty itself hidden in that dark shadow of the bridge. You shall know what we expect of you, resumed the minister, after allowing a short pause of Christophe's astonishment, in order that, you may make no mistake, we feel obliged to initiate you into the most important secrets of the Reformation. The prince and their Renaudie emphasized the minister's speech by gesture, the latter having paused to allow the prince to speak, if he so wished. Like all great men engaged in plotting, whose system it is to conceal their hand until the decisive moment, the prince kept silence, but not from cowardice. In these crises he was always the soul of the conspiracy, recoiling from no danger and ready to risk his own head, but from a sort of royal dignity he left the explanation of the enterprise to his minister and contented himself with studying the new instruments he was about to use. "'My child,' said Chaudieu, in the Huguenot style of address, we are about to do battle for the first time with the Roman prostitute. In a few days, either our legions will be dying on the scaffold or the Guises will be dead. This is the first call to arms on behalf of our religion in France, and France will not lay down those arms till they have conquered. The question, marquis this, concerns the nation, not the kingdom. The majority of the nobles of the kingdom see plainly what the Cardinal de Lorraine and his brother are seeking. Under pretext of defending the Catholic religion, the House of Lorraine means to claim the crown of France as its patrimony. Relying on the Church, it has made the Church a formidable ally. The monks are its support, its acolytes, its spies. It has assumed the post of guardian to the throne it is seeking to usurp. It protects the House of Valois, which it means to destroy. We have decided to take up arms because the liberties of the people and the interests of the nobles are equally threatened. Let us smother at its birth a faction as odious as that of the Burgundians who formerly put Paris and all France to fire on sword. It required a Louis XI to put a stop to the quarrel between the Burgundians and the crown, and today a Prince de Conde is needed to prevent the House of Lorraine from re-attempting that struggle. This is not a civil war. It is a duel between the Guises and the Reformation, a duel to the death. We will make their heads fall, or they shall have ours. Well said, cried the prince. In this crisis, Christophe, said La Rondie, we mean to neglect nothing which shall strengthen our party, for there is a party in the Reformation, the party of thwarted interests, of nobles sacrificed to the Lorrains, of old captains shamefully treated at Fontainebleau, from which the cardinal has banished them by setting up gibbets in which to hang those who ask the king for the cost of their equipment and their back pay. This, my child, resumed Chaudieu, observing a sort of terror in Christophe, this is which compels us to conquer by arms instead of conquering by conviction and by martyrdom. The queen mother is on the point of entering into our views. Not that she means to abjure, she has not reached that decision as yet she may be forced to it by a triumph. However that may be, Queen Catherine, humiliated and in despair at seeing the power she expected to wield on the death of the king, passing into the hands of the Guises, alarmed at the empire of the young queen, Mary, niece of the Lorraine, and their auxiliary, Queen Catherine is doubtless inclined to lend her support to the princes and lords who are now about to make an attempt which would deliver her from the Guises. At this moment, devoted as she may seem to them, she hates them, she desires their overthrow, and will try to make use of us against them. But, Monseigneur, the Prince de Conde intends to make use of her against all. The Queen Mother will undoubtedly consent to all our plans. 
We shall have the connetable on our side. Monseigneur has just been to see him at Chantilly, but he has not wished to move without an order from his masters. Being the uncle of Monseigneur, you will not leave him in the lurch, and this generous prince does not hesitate to fling himself into danger to force Anne de Montmorency to a decision. All is prepared, and we have cast our eyes on you as the means of communicating to Queen Catherine our treaty of alliance, the drafts of edicts, and the basis of the new government. The court is at Blois. Many of our friends are with it, but they are to be our future chiefs, and like Monseigneur, of importance. They would instantly be suspected and kept from communicating with Madame Catherine. God sends us, at this crisis, the shepherd David and his sling to do battle with Goliath of Guise. Your father, unfortunate for him, a good Catholic, is furrier to the two queens. He is constantly supplying them with garments. Let him to send you some errand to the court. You will excite no suspicion and you cannot compromise Queen Catherine in any way. All our leaders would lose their heads if a single imprudent act allowed their connivance with the Queen Mother to be seen. Where a great lord, if discovered, would give the alarm and destroy our chances, an insignificant man like you would pass unnoticed. See, the Guises keep the town so full of spies that we have only the river where we can talk without fear. You will now, my son, like a sentinel who must die at his post. Remember this, if you are discovered, we shall all abandon you. We shall even cast, if necessary, opprobrium and infamy upon you. We shall say that you are a creature of the Guises, and to play this part to ruin us. You see, therefore, that we ask of you a total sacrifice. If you perish, said the Prince de Conde, I pledge my honour as a noble that your family shall be sacred for the house of Navarre. I will bear it on my heart and serve it in all things. Those words, my prince, suffice, replied Christophe, without reflecting that the conspirator was a Gascon. We live in times when each man, prince or burgher, must do his duty. There speaks the true Huguenot. If all our men were like that, said La Renouille, laying his hand on Christophe's shoulder, we should be conquerors tomorrow. Young man, resumed the prince, I desire to show you that of Chaudier preaches. If the nobleman goes armed, the prince fights. Therefore, in this hot game, all stakes are played. Now listen to me, said La Renouille. I will not give you the papers until you reach Bougancy. They must not be risked during the whole of your journey will find me waiting for you there, on the wharf. My face, voice, and clothes will be so changed you cannot recognize me. But I shall say to you, are you a croipin, and you will answer, ready to serve. As to the performance of your mission, these are the means. You will find a horse at the Tinte Fleury, close to saint germain dans You will there ask for Jean Le Breton, who will take you to the stable and give you one of my ponies, which is known to do thirty leagues in eight hours. Leave by the gate of Boussy. Breton has a pass for me. Use it yourself and make your way by skirting the towns. You can thus reach Orléans by daybreak. But the horse, said young Lecamon. He will not give out till you reach Orléans, replied Le Rondy. Leave him at the entrance of the Faubourg Bannier, for the gates are well guarded and you must not excite suspicion. It is for you, friend, to play your part intelligently. You must invent whatever fable seems to you best to reach the third house to the left on entering Orléans. It belongs to a certain Torillon glove-maker. Strike three blows on the door and call out, On service for Monsieur de Guise. The man will appear to be a rabid Guisist. No one knows but our four selves that he is one of us. He will give you a faithful boatman, another Guisist of his own cut. Go down at once to the wharf and embark in a boat painted green and edged with white. You will doubtless land at Bougancy tomorrow about midday. There I will arrange to find you a boat which will take you to Blois without running any risk. Our enemies, the Guises, do not watch the rivers, only the landings. Thus you will be able to see the Queen Mother tomorrow or the day after. The words are written there, said Christophe, touching his forehead. Chaudieu embraced his child with singular religious fusion. He was proud of him. God keep thee, he said, pointing to the ruddy light of the sinking sun, which was touching the old roofs, covered with shingles and sending its gleams slantwise to the forest of piles among which the water was rippling. We belong to the race of the Jacques Bonhomme, said La Renaudie, pressing Christophe's sand. We shall meet again, monsieur, said the prince, with a gesture of infinite grace in which there was something that seemed almost friendship. 
With a stroke of his oars, La Renaudie put the boat at the lower step of the stairway which led to the house. Christophe landed, and the boat disappeared instantly beneath the arches of the Pont au Change. End of section three. Section four of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine de' Medici, Chapter Two, The Burghers. Christophe shook the iron railing which closed the stairway on the river and called. His mother heard him, opened one of the windows of the back shop, and asked what he was doing there. Christophe answered that he was cold and wanted to get in. Ah, my master," said the Burgundian maid. "You went out by the street door and you returned by the water gate." Your father will be fine and angry. Christophe, bewildered by a confidence which had just brought him into communication with the Prince de Conde, La Renaudie, and Chaudieu, and still more moved at the prospect of impending civil war, made no answer. He ran hastily up from the kitchen to the back shop, but his mother, a rabid Catholic, could not control her anger. I'll wager those three men I saw you talking with are rough. Hold your tongue, wife said the cautious old man with white hair who was turning over a thick ledger. You doddling fellows, he went on, addressing three journeymen who had long finished their suppers. Why don't you go to bed? It is eight o'clock, and you have to be up at five. Besides, you must carry home tonight. Rosalind, de deuce cap and mantle. All three of you had better go and take your sticks and rapiers, and then, if you meet scamps like yourselves, at least you'll be in force. Are we going to take the ermine surcoat the young queen has ordered to be sent to the Hotel de Soissons? There's an express going from there to Blois for the queen mother, said one of the clerks. No, said his master. The queen mother's bill amounts to three thousand crowns. It is time to get the money, and I am going to Blois myself very soon. Father, I do not think it right at your age, and in these dangerous times, to expose yourself on the high roads. I am twenty-two years old, and you ought to employ me on such errands said Christophe, eyeing the box which he supposed contained the surcoat. "'Are you glued to your seats?' cried the old man to his apprentices, who at once jumped up and seized their rapiers, cloaks, and Monsieur de Tous' furs. The next day the Parliament was to receive in state as its president this illustrious judge, who, after signing a death warrant of Councillor de Bourg, was destined before the close of the year to sit in judgment on the Prince de Conde. Here, said the old man, calling to the maid. Go and ask friend Lallier if you will come and sup with us and bring the wine. We'll furnish the victuals. Tell him, above all, to bring his daughter. Lecamus, the syndic of the Guild of Furriers, was a handsome old man of sixty, with white hair and broad, open brow. As court furrier for the past forty years, he had witnessed all the revolutions of the reign of François I. He had seen the arrival at the French court of the young girl Catherine de Medici, then scarcely fifteen years of age. He had observed her giving way before the Duchesse de Tempes, her father-in-law's mistress, giving way before the Duchesse de Valentinois, the mistress of her husband, the late king. But the furrier had brought himself safely through all the chances and changes by which court merchants were often involved in the disgrace and overthrow of mistresses. His caution led to his good luck. He maintained an attitude of extreme humility. Pride had never caught him in its toils. He made himself so small, so gentle, so compliant, of so little account at court, and before the queens and princesses and favourites, that this modesty, combined with good humour, had kept the royal sign above his door. Such a policy was, of course, indicative of a shrewd and perspicacious mind. Humble as Lecamus seemed to the outer world, he was despotic in his own home. There he was an autocrat. Most respected and honoured by his brother craftsmen, he owed to his long possession of the first place in the trade much of the consideration that was shown to him. He was, besides, very willing to do kindness to others, and among the many servants he had rendered, none was more striking than the assistance he had long given to the greatest surgeon of the sixteenth century, Amboise Parr, who owed to him the possibility of studying for his profession. In all the difficulties which came up among the merchants, Le Camus was always conciliating. Thus a general good opinion of him consolidated his position among his equals, while his borrowed characteristics kept him steadily in favour with the court. 
Not only this, but having intrigued for the honour of being on the vestry of his parish church, he did what was necessary to bring him into the odour of sanctity with the rector of saint pierre aux boeufs who looked upon him as one of the men most devoted to the Catholic religion in Paris. Consequently, at the time of the convocation of the States General, he was unanimously elected to represent the tiers etat through the influence of the clergy of Paris, an influence which, at that period, was immense. The old man was, in short, one of those secretly ambitious souls who will bend for fifty years before all the world, gliding from office to office, no one exactly knowing how it came about that he was found securely and peacefully seated at last, where no man, even the boldest, would have had the ambition at the beginning of life to fancy himself. So great was the distance, so many the gulfs and the precipices to cross. Le Camus, who had immense concealed wealth, would not run any risks, and was silently preparing a brilliant future for his son. Instead of having the personal ambition which sacrifices the future to the present, he had family ambition, a lost sentiment in our time, a sentiment suppressed by the folly of our laws of inheritance. Lacamus saw himself first president of the Parliament of Paris in the person of his grandson. Christophe, godson of the famous historian de Thou, was given a most solid education, but it led him to doubt and to the spirit of examination which was then affecting both the faculties and the students of the universities. Christophe was, at the period of which we are now writing, pursuing his studies for the bar, that first step towards magistracy. The old furrier was pretending to some hesitation as to his son. Sometimes he seemed to wish to make Christophe his successor. Then again he spoke of him as a lawyer. But in his heart he was ambitious of a place for this son as councillor of the parliament. He wanted to put the Lecamus family on a level with those old and celebrated burgher families from which came the Pasquier, the Mole, the Miron, the Seguier, la Mouinon, du Tillet, le Coineux, l'Escalopier, Gua, Arnaud, those famous sheriffs and grand provosts of the merchants among whom the throne found such strong defenders. Therefore, in order that Christophe might in due course of time maintain his rank, he wished to marry him to the daughter of the richest jeweller in the city, his friend Lallier, whose nephew was destined to present to Henri the Fourth the keys of Paris. The strongest desire rooted in the heart of the worthy burgher was to use half of his fortune and half of that of the jeweller in the purchase of a large and beautiful seigneurial estate, which in those days was a long and very difficult affair. But his shrewd mind knew the age in which he lived too well to be ignorant of the great movements which were now in preparation. He saw clearly, and he saw justly, and knew that the kingdom was about to be divided into two camps. The useless executions in the Place de l'Estrapade, that of the king's tailor, and the more recent one of the councillor and the Borg, the actual connivance of the great lords, and that of the favourite of Francois I with the reformers, were terrible indications. The furrier resolved to remain, whatever happened, Catholic, royalist, and parliamentarian. But it suited him privately that Christophe should belong to the Reformation. He knew he was rich enough to ransom his son Christophe, too much compromised, and on the other hand, if France became Calvinist, his son could save the family in the event of one of those furious Parisian riots, the memory of which was ever living with the bourgeoisie. Riots they were destined to see renewed through four reigns. But these thoughts, the old furrier, like Louis XI, did not even say to himself, his wariness went so far as to deceive his wife and son. This grave personage had long been the chief man of the richest and most populous quarter of Paris, that of the centre, under the title of Quartenier, the title and office which became so celebrated some fifteen months later. Clothed in cloth like all the prudent burghers who obeyed the sumptuary laws, Sieur Le Camus, he was tenacious of that title, which Charles V granted to the burghers of Paris, permitting them also to buy baronial estates and call their wives by the fine name of Demoiselle, but not by that of Madame, wore neither gold chains nor silk, but always a good doublet with large tarnished silver buttons, cloth gaiters mounting to the knee, and leather shoes with clasps. His shirt of fine linen showed, according to the fashion of the time, in great puffs between his half-open jacket and his breeches. Though his large and handsome face received the full light of the lamp standing on the table, Christophe had no conception of the thoughts which lay buried beneath the rich and florid Dutch skin of the old man but he understood well enough the advantage he himself had expected to obtain from his affection for pretty Babette Lallier. So Christophe 
with the air of a man who had come to a decision, smiled bitterly as he heard of the invitation to his promised bride. When the Burgundian cook and the apprentices had departed on their several errands, old Lecamu looked at his wife with a glance which showed the firmness and resolution of his character. You will not be satisfied till you have got that boy hanged with your damned tongue, he said in a stern voice. I would rather see him hanged and saved than living in a Huguenot, she answered gloomily. To think that a child whom I carried nine months in my womb should be a bad Catholic and be doomed to hell for all eternity. She began to weep. Old oh, silly, said the furrier. Let him live, if only to convert him. You said before the apprentices a word which may set fire to our house and roast us all like fleas in a straw bed. The mother crossed herself and sat down silently. Now then, you, said the old man with a judicial glance at his son, explain to me what you are doing on the river with come closer that I may speak to you, he added, grasping his son by the arm and drawing him to him. The Prince de Conde, he whispered. Christophe trembled. Do you suppose a court furrier does not know every face that frequents the palace? Think you I am ignorant of what is going on? Monseigneur the Grand Master has been giving orders to send troops to Amboise, withdrawing troops from Paris to send them to Amboise when the king is at Blois, and making them march through Chartres and Vendôme instead of going by Orléans. Isn't the meaning of that clear enough? There'll be troubles. If the queens want their circles, they must send for them. The Prince de Conde has perhaps made up his mind to kill Monsieur de Guise, who on their side expect to rid themselves of him. The prince will use the Huguenots to protect himself. Why should the son of a furrier get himself into that fray? When you are married and when you are counsellor to the parliament, you will be as prudent as your father. Before belonging to the new religion, the son of a furrier ought to wait until the rest of the world belongs to it. I don't condemn the reformers. It is not my business to do so. But the court is Catholic. The two queens are Catholic. The parliament is Catholic. We must supply them with furs, and therefore we must be Catholic ourselves. You shall not go out from here, Christophe. If you do, I will send you to your godfather, President de Tou. He will, he will keep you night and day blackening paper, instead of blackening your soul in company with those damned Genevese. Father, said Christophe, leaning upon the back of the old man's chair, send me to Blois to carry that circuit to Queen Mary, and get our money from the Queen Mother. If you do not, I am lost, and you care for your son. Lost, repeated the old man without showing the least surprise. If you stay here, you can't be lost. I shall have my eye on you all the time. They will kill me here. Why? The most important among the Huguenots have cast their eyes on me to serve them in a certain matter. If I fail to do what I have just promised to do, they will kill me in open day, here in the street, as they killed me now. But if you send me to court on your affairs, perhaps I can justify myself equally well to both sides. Either I shall succeed without having run any danger at all, I shall then win a fine position in the party, or, if the danger turns out very great, I shall be there simply on your business. The father rose as if his chair was of red-hot iron. Wife, he said, leave us and watch that we are left quite alone, Christophe and I. When Mademoiselle Le Camus had left them, the furrier took his son by a button and led him to the corner of the room which made the angle of the bridge. Christophe, he said, whispering in his ear, as he had done when he mentioned the name of the Prince of Conde. Be a Huguenot, if you have that vice, but be so cautiously in the depths of your soul, and not in a way to be pointed at as a heretic throughout the quarter. What you have just confessed to me shows that the leaders have confidence in you. What are you going to do for them at court? I cannot tell you, replied Christophe, for I do not know myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. muttered the old man, looking at his son. The scamp means to hoodwink his father. He'll go far. You are not going to court, he went on in a low tone, to carry remittances to Monsieur de Guise, or to the little king or master, or to the little Queen Marie. All those arts are Catholic. But I would take my oath the Italian woman as some spite against the Scotch girl and against the Lorrain. I know her. She has a desperate desire to put her hand into the door. The late king was so afraid of her that he did as the jewellers do. He cut diamond by diamond. He pitted one woman against another. 
that caused Queen Catherine's hatred to the poor Duchess de Valentinois, from whom she took the beautiful chateau of Chenonso. If it hadn't been for the connetable, the Duchess might have been strangled. Back, back, my son, don't put yourself in the hands of that Italian, who has no passion except in her brain, as that's a bad kind of woman. Yes, but they are sending you to do at court and give you a bad headache cried the father, seeing that Christophe was about to reply. My son, I have plans for your future, which you will not upset by making yourself useful to Queen Catherine. But heavens and earth, don't whisk your head. Messieurs de Guise would cut it off as easily as the Burgundian cuts a turnip, and then those persons who are now employing you will disown you utterly. I know that, father, said Christophe. What? Are you really so strong, my son? You know it? Then are willing to whisk all? Yes, father. By the powers above us, cried the father, pressing his son in his arms. We can understand each other. You are worthy of your father. My child, you will be the honour of the family. And I see that your old father can speak plainly with you. But do not be more Huguenot than Monsieur de Coligny. Never draw your sword. Be a pen man. Keep to your future role of lawyer. Now then, tell me nothing until after you have succeeded. If I do not hear from you by the fourth day after you reach Blar, that silence will tell me that you are in some danger. The old man will go to save the young one. I have not sold furs for thirty-two years without a good knowledge of the wrong side of court orbs. I have the means of making my way through many doors. Christophe opened his eyes very wide as he heard his father talking thus, but he thought there might be some parental trap in it, and he made no reply further than to say, Well, make out the bill and write a letter to the Queen. I must start at once. The greatest misfortunes may happen. Start? How? I shall buy a horse. Write at once, in God's name. Hey, mother, give your son some money, cried the furrier to his wife. The mother returned and went to her chest, took out a purse of gold and gave it to Christophe, who kissed her with emotion. The bill was all ready, said his father. Here it is. I will write the letter at once. Christophe took the bill and put it in his pocket. But you will sup with us at any rate, said the old man. In such a crisis you ought to exchange wings with Lallier's daughter. Very well, I will go and fetch her, said Christophe. The young man was distrustful of his father's stability in the matter. The old man's character was not yet fully known to him. He ran up to his room, dressed himself, took a valise, came downstairs softly, and laid it on a counter in the shop, together with his rapier and cloak. What the devil are you doing? asked his father, hearing him. Christophe came up to the old man and kissed him on both cheeks. I don't want anyone to see my preparations for departure, and I put them on a counter in the shop, he whispered. Here is the letter, said his father. Christophe took the paper and went out as if to fetch his young neighbour. A few moments after his departure, the goodman Lallier and his daughter arrived, preceded by a servant woman bearing three bottles of old wine. Well, where is Christophe? said old Lecamus. Christophe, exclaimed Babette, we have not seen him. Ah! Ah, my son is a bold scamp. He tricks me as if I had no beard. My dear crony, what think you he would turn out to be? We live in days when the children have more sense than their fathers. Why, the quarter has long been saying he is in some mischief, said Lallier. Excuse him on that point, crony, said the furrier. Youth is foolish. It runs after new things. But Babette will keep him quiet. She is newer than Galvin. Babette smiled. She loved Christophe and was angry when anything was said against him. She was one of those daughters of the old bourgeoisie, brought up under the eyes of a mother who never left her. Her bearing was gentle and correct as her face. She always wore woollen stuffs of grey, harmonious in tone. Her chemisette, simply pleated, contrasted its whiteness against the gown. Her cap of brown velvet was like an infant's coif, but it was trimmed with a ruche and lapets of tanned gauze, that is, of a tan colour, which came down on each side of her face. Though fair and white as a true blonde, she seemed to be shrewd and roguish, all the while trying to hide her roguishness under the air and manner of a well-trained girl. While well, the two servant women went and came, laying the cloth and placing the jugs, the great pewter dishes and the knives and forks, the jeweller and his daughter, the furrier and his wife, sat before the tall chimney-piece draped with lambrequins of red serge and black fringes, and were talking of trifles. Babette asked once or twice where Christophe could be, and the father and mother of the young Huguenot gave evasive answers. But when the two families were seated at table, and the two servants had retired to the kitchen, Lecamus said to his future daughter-in-law, 
Christophe has gone to court. To Blois? Such a journey as that, without bidding me good-bye? she said. The matter was pressing, said the old mother. Crony, said the furrier, resuming a suspended conversation. We are going to have troublous times in France. The reformers are bestirring themselves. If they triumph, it will only be after a long war, during which business will be at a standstill, said Lallier, incapable of rising higher than the commercial sphere. My father, who saw the wars between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, told me that our family would never have come out safely if one of his grandfathers, his mother's father, had not been a guar, one of those famous butchers in the market who stood by the Burgundians, whereas the other, the Lecamou, was for the Armagnacs. They seemed ready to flay each other alive before the world, but they were excellent friends in the family. So let us both try to save Christophe. Perhaps the time may come when he will save us. You are a shrewd one, said the jeweller. No, replied Lecamus. The burghers ought to think of themselves. The populace and the nobility are both against them. The Parisian bourgeoisie alarms everybody except the king, who knows it is his friend. You who are so wise and have seen so many things, said Babette timidly, explain to me what the reformers really want. Yes, tell us that, Crony, cried the jeweller. I knew the late king's tailor, and I held him to be a man of simple life, without great talent. He was something like you, a man to whom they'd give the sacrament without confession, and behold, he plunged to the depths of this new religion. He, a man whose two years were worth all of a hundred thousand crowns apiece. He must have had secrets to reveal to induce the king and the duchess of de Valentinois to be present at his torture. And terrible secrets, too, said the furrier. The Reformation, my friends, he continued in a low voice, will give back to the bourgeoisie the estates of the church. When the ecclesiastical privileges are suppressed, the reformers intend to ask that the villain shall be imposed on nobles as well as on burghers, and they mean to insist that the king alone shall be above others, if indeed they allow the state to have a king. Suppress the throne, ejaculated Lallier. Eh, crony, said Lecamus, in the low countries, the burghers govern themselves with burgomasters of their own, who elect their own temporary head. God bless me, Crony, we ought to do these fine things, and yet stay Catholics, cried the jeweller. We are too old, you and I, to see the triumph of the Parisian bourgeoisie, but it will triumph, I tell you, in times to come, as it did of yore. Ah, the king must rest upon it in order to resist, and we have always sold him our help dear. The last time all the burghers were ennobled, and he gave them permission to buy seigneurial estates and take titles from the land without special letters from the king. You and I, grandsons of the Guar, through our mothers, are not we as good as any lord? These words were so alarming to the jeweller and the two women that they were followed by a dead silence. The ferments of 1789 were already tingling in the veins of Lecamus, who was not yet so old, but what he could live to see the bold burghers of the League. Are you selling well in spite of these troubles? said Lallier to Mademoiselle Lecamus. Troubles always do harm, she replied. That's one reason why I am. So set on making my son a lawyer, said Lecom, for squabbles and law go on forever. The conversation then turned to commonplace topics, to the great satisfaction of the jeweller, who was not fond of either political troubles or audacity of thought. End of chapter 2, section 4. Section 5 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. The Chateau de Blois. The banks of the Loire, from Blois to Angers, were the favourite resort of the last two branches of the royal race which occupied the throne before the House of Bourbon. That beautiful valley plain so well deserves the honour bestowed upon it by kings that we must here repeat what was said of it by one of our most eloquent writers. There is one province in France which is never sufficiently admired, fragrant as Italy, flowery as the banks of the Guadalquivir, beautiful especially in its own characteristics, wholly French, having always been French, unlike in that respect to our northern provinces which have degenerated by contact with Germany, and to our southern provinces which have lived in concubinage with Moors, Spaniards, and all other nationalities that adjoined them. This 
pure, chaste, brave, and loyal province is Touraine. The historic France is there. Auvergne is Auvergne. Languedoc is only Languedoc. But Touraine is France. The most national river for Frenchmen is the Loire, which waters Touraine. For this reason, we ought not to be surprised at the great number of historically noble buildings possessed by those departments which have taken the name or derivations of the name of the Loire. At every step we take in this land of enchantment, we discover a new picture, bordered, it may be, by a river or a tranquil lake reflecting in its liquid depths a castle with towers and woods and sparkling waterfalls. It is quite natural that in a region chosen by royalty for its sojourn, where the court was long established, great families and fortunes and distinguished men should have settled and built palaces as grand as themselves. But it is not incomprehensible that royalty did not follow the advice indirectly given by Louis XI to place the capital of the kingdom at Tours. There, without great expense, the Loire might have been made accessible for the merchant service and also for vessels of war of light draught. There, too, the seat of government would have been safe from the dangers of invasion. Had this been done, the northern cities would not have required such vast sums of money spent to fortify them, sums as vast as were those expended on the sumptuous glories of Versailles. If Louis the Fourteenth had listened to Vauban, who wished to build his great palace at Mont-Louis, between the Loire and the Cher, perhaps the revolution of 1789 might never have taken place. These beautiful shores still bear the marks of royal tenderness. The chateaux of Chambord, Amboise, Blois, Chenonceau, Chaumont, de six les tours all those which the mistresses of kings, financiers, and nobles built at Perrette's, Essay, Le Redou, Ousset, Villandry, Balancé, Chanteloup, de la Tal, some of which have disappeared, though most of them still remain, are admirable relics which remind us of the marvels of a period that is little understood by the literary sect of the Middle Ages. Among all these chateaux, that of Blois, where the court was then staying, is one on which the magnificence of the houses of Orléans and of Valois has placed its brilliant sign manual, making it the most interesting of all for historians, archaeologists, and Catholics. It was at the time of which we write completely isolated. The town, enclosed by massive walls supported by towers, lay below the fortress. The chateau served, in fact, as fort and pleasure house. Above the town, with its blue-tiled, crowded roofs, extending then, as now, from the river to the crest of the hill, which commands the right bank, lies a triangular plateau, bounded to the west by a streamlet, which in these days is of no importance, for it flows beneath the town. But in the 15th century, so say historians, it formed quite a deep ravine, of which there still remains a sunken road, almost an abyss between the suburbs of the town and the chateau. It was on this plateau, with a double exposure to the north and south, that the Counts of Blois built, in the architecture of the 12th century, a castle where the famous Thibault de Tierchur, Thibault le Vieux, and others held a celebrated court. In those days of pure feudality, in which the king was merely primus inter pares, to use the fine expression of a king of Poland, the Counts of Champagne, the Counts of Blois, those of Anjou, the simple barons of Normandy, the dukes of Bretagne, lived with the splendour of sovereign princes and gave kings to the proudest kingdoms. The Plantagenets of Anjou, the Lucinans of Poitou, the Roberts of Normandy, maintained with a bold hand the royal races, and sometimes simple knights like Du Glaquin refused the purple, preferring the sword of Connetable. When the crown annexed the county of Blois to its domain, Louis XII, who had a liking for this residence, perhaps to escape Plessis of sinister memory, built at the back of the first building another building, facing east and west, which connected the chateau of the Counts of Blois with the rest of the old structures, of which nothing now remains but the vast hall in which the States General were held under Henri III. Before he became enamoured of Chambord, Francois I wished to complete the Chateau of Bois by adding two other wings, which would have made the structure a perfect square. But Chambord weaned him from Bois, where he built only one wing, which in his time and that of his grandchildren was the only inhabited part of the chateau. 
This third building, erected by Francois I, is more vast and far more decorated than the Louvre, the chateau of Henri II. It is in the style of architecture now called Renaissance, and presents the most fantastic features of that style. Therefore, at a period when a strict and jealous architecture ruled construction, when the Middle Ages were not even considered, at a time when literature was not as clearly welded to art as it is now, La Fontaine said of the Chateau de Blois in his hearty, good-humoured way, The part that Francois I built, if looked at from the outside, pleased me better than all the rest. There I saw numbers of little galleries, little windows, little balconies, little ornamentations, without order or regularity, and they make up a grand hall, which I like. The Chateau of Blois had therefore the merit of representing three orders of architecture, three epochs, three systems, three dominions. Perhaps there is no other royal residence that can compare with it in that respect. This immense structure presents to the eye in one enclosure round one courtyard a complete and perfect image of that grand presentation of the manners and customs and life of nations which is called architecture. At the moment when Christophe was to visit the court, that part of the adjacent land which in our day is covered by a fourth palace built seventy years later by Gaston, the rebellious brother of Louis the Thirteenth, then exiled to Blois, was an open space containing pleasure grounds and hanging gardens picturesquely placed among the battlements and unfinished turrets of Francois I's chateau. These gardens, communicated by a bridge of a fine, bold construction, which the old men of Blois may still remember to have seen demolished, with a pleasure ground on the other side of the chateau, which, by the lay of the land, was on the same level. The nobles attached to the court of Anne de Bretagne, or those of that province who came to solicit favours, or to confer with the queen as to the fate and condition of Brittany, awaited in this pleasure ground the opportunity for an audience, either at the queen's rising, or at her coming out to walk. Consequently, history has given the name of Peuchois or Breton to this piece of ground, which, in our day, is the fruit garden of a wealthy bourgeois, and forms a projection into the Place des Jesuites. The latter place was included in the gardens of this beautiful royal residence, which had, as we have said, its upper and its lower gardens. Not far from the Place des Jesuites may still be seen a pavilion built by Catherine de' Medici, where, according to the historians of Blois, warm mineral baths were placed for her to use. This detail enables us to trace the very irregular disposition of the gardens, which went up and down according to the undulations of the ground, becoming extremely intricate around the chateau a fact which helped to give it strength and caused, as we shall see, the discomfiture of the Duc de Guise. The gardens were reached from the chateau through external and internal galleries, the most important of which was called the Gallery de Cerf, on account of its decoration. This gallery led to the magnificent staircase which no doubt inspired the famous double staircase of Chambord. It led from floor to floor to all the apartments of the castle. Though La Fontaine preferred the Chateau of Francois I to that of Louis XII, perhaps the naivete of that of the good king will give true artists more pleasure, while at the same time they admire the magnificent structure of the knightly king. The elegance of the two staircases, which are placed at each end of the Chateau of Louis XII, the delicate carving and sculpture, so original in design, which abound everywhere, the remains of which, though time has done its worst, still charm the antiquary all, even to the semi-cloistral distribution of the apartments, reveals a great simplicity of manners. Evidently, the court did not yet exist. It had not developed, as it did under Francois I and Catherine de Medici, to the great detriment of feudal customs. As we admire the galleries, or most of them, the capitals of the columns and certain figurines of exquisite delicacy, it is impossible not to imagine that Michel Colomb, that great sculpture of the Michelangelo of Brittany, passed that way for the pleasure of Queen Anne, whom he afterwards immortalised on the tomb of her father, the last Duke of Brittany. Whatever La Fontaine may choose to say about these little galleries and the little ornamentations, nothing can be more grandiose than the dwelling of the splendid Francois. Thanks to I know not what indifference, to forgetfulness perhaps, the apartments occupied by Catherine de' Medici and her son Francois II present to us today the leading features of that time. The historian can there restore the tragic scenes of the drama of the Reformation, a drama in which the dual struggle of the Guises and the Bourbons against the Valois was a series of most complicated acts, the plot of which was here unravelled. 
The chateau of Francois I completely crushes the artless habitation of Louis XII by its imposing masses. On the side of the gardens, that is, toward the modern Place des Jesuites, the castle presents an elevation nearly double that which it shows on the side of the courtyard. The ground floor on this side forms the second floor on the side of the gardens, where are placed the celebrated galleries. Thus the first floor above the ground floor toward the courtyard, where Queen Catherine was lodged, is the third floor on the garden side, and the king's apartments were four stories above the garden, which at the time of which we write was separated from the base of the castle by a deep moat. The chateau, already colossal as viewed from the courtyard, appears gigantic when seen from below, as La Fontaine saw it. He mentions particularly that he did not enter either the courtyard or the apartments, and it is to be remarked that from the Place des Jesuites all the details seem small. The balconies on which the courtiers promenaded, the galleries marvellously executed, the sculptured windows whose embrasures are so deep as to form boudoirs, for which indeed they served, resemble at that great height of the fantastic decorations which scene painters give to a fairy palace at the opera. But in the courtyard, although the three stories above the ground floor rise as high as the clock tower of the Tuileries, the infinite delicacy of the architecture reveals itself to the rapture of our astonished eyes. This wing of the great building, in which the two queens, Catherine de' Medici and Mary Stuart, held their sumptuous court, is divided in the centre by a hexagon tower, in the empty well of which winds up a spiral staircase, a Moorish caprice designed by giants, made by dwarfs, which gives to this wonderful façade the effect of a dream. The baluster of this staircase forms a spiral connecting itself by a square landing to five of the six sides of the tower, requiring at each landing transversal corbels which are decorated with arabesque carvings without and within. This bewildering creation of ingenious and delicate details, of marvels which give speech to stones, can be compared only to the deeply worked and crowded carving of the Chinese ivories. Stone is made to look like lace work. The flowers, the figures of men and animals clinging to the structure of the stairway are multiplied step by step until they crown the tower with a keystone on which the chisels of the art of the 16th century have contended against the naive cutters of images who 50 years earlier had carved the keystones of Louis XII's two stairways. However dazzled we may be by these recurring forms of indefatigable labour, we cannot fail to see that money was lacking to Francois I, for Blois as it was to Louis XIV of Versailles. More than one figurine lifts its delicate head from a block of rough stone behind it. More than one fantastic flower is merely indicated by chiselled touchings on the abandoned stone, though dampness has since laid its blossoms of mouldy greenery upon it. On a façade side by side with the tracery of one window, another window presents its masses of jagged stone carved only by the hand of time. Here, to the least artistic and the least trained eye, is a ravishing contrast between this frontage, where marvels throng, and the interior frontage of the Chateau of Louis XII, which is composed of a ground floor of arcades of fairy lightness supported by tiny columns resting at their base on a graceful platform, and of two stories above it the windows of which are carved with delightful sobriety. Beneath the arcade is a gallery, the walls of which are painted in fresco. The ceiling also being painted, traces can still be found of this magnificence, derived from Italy and testifying to the expeditions of our kings, to which the Principality of Milan then belonged. Opposite to Francois I's wing was the chapel of the Counts of Blois, the façade of which is almost in harmony with the architecture of the later dwelling of Louis XII. No words can picture the majestic solidity of these three distinct masses of building. In spite of their non-conformity of style, royalty, powerful and firm, demonstrating its dangers by the greatness of its precautions, was a bond, uniting these three edifices, so different in character, two of which rested against the vast hall of the States General, towering high like a church. Certainly neither the simplicity nor the strength of the burgher existence, which were depicted at the beginning of this history, in which art was always represented, were lacking to this royal habitation. Blois was the fruitful and brilliant example to which the bourgeoisie and feudality, wealth and nobility, gave such splendid replies in the towns and in the rural regions. 
Imagination could not desire any other sort of dwelling for the prince who reigned over France in the 16th century. The richness of seigneurial garments, the luxury of female adornment, must have harmonized delightfully with the lace work of these stones, so wonderfully manipulated. From floor to floor, as the king of France went up the marvellous staircase of his chateau of Bois, he could see the broad expanse of the beautiful Loire, which brought him news of all his kingdom as it lay on either side of the great river, two halves of a state facing each other and semi-rivals. If, instead of building Chambord in a barren, gloomy plain two leagues away, Francois I had placed it where, seventy years later, Gaston built his palace, Versailles would never have existed, and Blois would have become, necessarily, the capital of France. Four Valois and Catherine de' Medici lavished their wealth on the wing built by Francois I at Blois. Who can look at those massive partition walls, the spinal column of the castle in which are sunken deep alcoves, secret staircases, cabinets, while they themselves enclose halls as vast as that great council room, the guardroom, and the royal chambers in which, in our day, a regiment of infantry is comfortably lodged? Who can look at all this and not be aware of the prodigalities of crown and court? Even if a visitor does not at once understand how the splendour within must have corresponded with the splendour without, the remaining vestiges of Catherine de Medici's cabinet, where Christophe was about to be introduced, would bear sufficient testimony to the elegancies of art, which peopled those apartments with animated designs in which salamanders sparkled among the wreaths, and the palette of the sixteenth century illumined the darkest corners with its brilliant colouring. In this cabinet, an observer will still find traces of that taste for gilding which Catherine brought with her from Italy. For the princesses of her house loved, in the words of the author already quoted, to veneer the castles of France with the gold earned by their ancestors in commerce, and to hang out their wealth on the walls of their apartments. The Queen Mother occupied on the first upper floor of the apartments of Queen Claude of France, wife of Francois I, which may still be seen, delicately carved, the double C, accompanied by figures purely white, swans and lilies, signifying candidior candidis, more white than the whitest. The motto of the queen, whose name began, like that of Catherine, with a C, and which applied as well to the daughter of Louis XII as to the mother of the last Valois, for no suspicion, in spite of the violence of Calvinist calumny, has tarnished the fidelity of Catherine de' Medici to Henri II. The Queen Mother, still charged with the care of two young children, him who was afterward Duc d'Alencon and Marguerite, the wife of Henri IV, the sister whom Charles IX called Margot, had need of the whole of the first upper floor. The King, Francois II, and the Queen, Mary Stuart, occupied on the second floor the royal apartments which had formerly been those of Francois I and were subsequently those of Henri III. This floor, like that taken by the Queen Mother, is divided in two parts throughout its whole length by the famous partition wall, which is more than four feet thick, against which rests the enormous walls which separate the rooms from each other. Thus, on both floors, the apartments are in two distinct halves. One half, to the south, looking to the courtyard, served for public receptions and for the transaction of business, whereas the private apartments were placed partly to escape the heat to the north, overlooking the gardens, on which side is the splendid façade with its balconies and galleries looking out upon the open country of the Vendomois and down upon the Pochoir des Bretons and the moat, the only side of which La Fontaine speaks. Chateau Francois I was in those days terminated by an enormous unfinished tower, which was intended to mark the colossal angle of the building when the succeeding wing was built. Later, Gaston took down one side of it in order to build his palace onto it. He never finished the work, and the tower remained in ruins. His royal stronghold served as a prison or dungeon, according to popular tradition. As we wander today through the halls of this matchless chateau, so precious to art and to history, what poet would not be haunted by regrets and grieved for France at seeing the arabesques of Catherine's boudoir whitewashed and almost obliterated by order of the quartermaster of the barracks? This royal residence is now a barrack at the time of an outbreak of cholera. The panels of Catherine's boudoir, a room of which we are about to speak, is the last remaining relic of the rich decorations accumulated by five artistic kings. 
making our way through the labyrinth of chambers, halls, stairways, towers, we may say to ourselves with solemn certitude, here Mary Stuart cajoled her husband on behalf of the Guises. There the Guises insulted Catherine. Later, at the very spot, the second Balafre fell beneath the daggers of the avengers of the crown. A century earlier, from this very window, Louis the Twelfth made signs to his friend Cardinal d'Ambois to come to him. Here, on this balcony, Depanon, the accomplice of Ravalac, met Marie de Medici, who knew it was said of the proposed regicide and allowed it to be committed. In the chapel where the marriage of Henri the Fourth and Marguerite de Valois took place, the sole remaining fragment of the chateau of the Counts of Blois, a regiment now makes its shoes. This wonderful structure in which so many styles may still be seen, so many great deeds have been performed, is in a state of dilapidation which disgraces France. What grief for those who love the great historic monuments of our country, to know that soon those eloquent stones will be lost to sight and knowledge, like others at the corner of the Rue de la Vieille Pelletinie. Possibly they will exist nowhere in these pages. It is necessary to remark that, in order to watch the royal court more closely, the Guises, although they had a house of their own in the town, which still exists, had obtained permission to occupy the upper floor above the apartments of Louis XII, the same lodgings afterwards occupied by the Duchess de Nemours under the roof. The young king, Francois II, and his bride, Mary Stuart, in love with each other like the girl and boy of sixteen which they were, had been abruptly transferred in the depth of winter from the chateau de saint germain which the duc de guise thought liable to attack to the fortress which the chateau of blois then was being isolated and protected on three sides by precipices and admirably defended as to its entrance the guises uncles of mary stuart had powerful reasons for not residing in paris and for keeping the king and court in a castle the whole exterior surroundings of which could easily be watched and defended a struggle was now beginning around the throne between the house of Lorraine and the house of Valois, which was destined to end in this very chateau, twenty-eight years later, namely in 1588, when Henri III, under the very eyes of his mother, at that moment deeply humiliated by the Dorians, heard the fall upon the floor of his own cabinet, the head of the boldest of all the Guises, second Balafre, son of that first Balafre, by whom Catherine de' Medici was now being tricked watched, threatened, and virtually imprisoned. End of section 5section six of catherine de medici by honor de balzac translated by catherine prescott warming this librivox recording is in the public domain this noble chateau of blois was to catherine de medici the narrowest of prisons on the death of her husband, who had always held her in subjection, she expected to reign, but on the contrary she found herself crushed under the thraldom of strangers, whose polished manners were really far more brutal than those of jailers. No action of hers could be done secretly. The women who attended her either had lovers among the Guises, or were watched by Argus eyes. These were times when passions notably exhibited the strange effects produced in all ages by the strong antagonism of two powerful conflicting interests in the state. Gallantry, which served Catherine so well, was also an auxiliary for the Guises. The Prince de Conde, the first leader of the Reformation, was a lover of the Marshal de Saint André, whose husband was the tool of the Grand Master. The Cardinal, convinced by the affair of the Vidame de Chartres that Catherine was more unconquered than invulnerable as to love, was paying court to her. The play of all these passions strangely complicated those of politics making, as it were, a double game of chess in which both parties had to watch the head and heart of their opponent in order to know, when a crisis came, whether the one would betray the other. Though she was constantly in presence of the Cardinal de Lara or of Duke François de Guise, who had both distrusted her, the closest and ablest enemy of Catherine de Medici was her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary, a fair little creature, malicious as a waiting maid, proud as a steward wearing three crowns, learned as an old pedant, giddy as a schoolgirl, as much in love with her husband as a courtesan is with her lover, devoted to her uncles whom she admired and delighted to see the king share, at her instigation, the regard she had for them, 
The mother-in-law is always a person whom the daughter-in-law is inclined not to like, especially when she wears the crown and wishes to retain it, which Catherine had imprudently made but too well known. Her former position, when Diane de Poitiers had ruled Henri II, was more tolerable than this, then at least she received the external honours that were due to a queen, and the homage of the court. But now the duke and the cardinal, who had none but their own minions about them, seemed to take pleasure in abasing her. Catherine, hemmed in on all sides by their courtiers, received not only day by day, but from hour to hour, terrible blows to her pride and her self-love for the guises were determined to treat her on the same system of repression which the late king her husband had so long pursued the thirty-six years of anguish which were now about to desolate france may perhaps be said to have begun by the scene in which the son of the furrier of the two queens was sent on the perilous errand which makes him the chief figure of our present study the danger into which this zealous reformer was about to fall became imminent the very morning on which he started from the port of Bourgancy for the chateau de blois bearing precious documents which compromised the highest heads of the nobility, placed in his hands by that wily partisan, the indefatigable Le Renaudie, who met him, as agreed upon, at Bourgancy, having reached that port before him. While the tow-boat in which Christophe now embarked floated, impelled by a light east wind, down the river Loire, the famous Cardinal de Lorraine and his brother, the second Duc de Guise, one of the greatest warriors of those days were contemplating like eagles perched on a rocky summit their present situation and looking prudently about them before striking the great blow by which they intended to kill the reform in france at amboise an attempt renewed twelve years later in paris august the twenty fourth fifteen seventy two on the feast of saint bartholomew during the night three seigneurs who each played a great part in the twelve years drama which followed this double plot now laid by the guises and also by the reformers had arrived at blois from different directions each riding at full speed and leaving their horses half dead at the postern gate of the chateau which was guarded by captains and soldiers absolutely devoted to the duc de guise the idol of all warriors one word about that great man a word that must tell in the first instance whence his fortunes took their rise his mother was Antoinette de Bourbon, great aunt of Henri the Fourth. Of what avail is consanguinity? He was at this moment aiming at the head of his cousin, the Prince de Conde. His niece was Mary Stuart. His wife was Anne, a daughter of the Duke of Ferrara. The Grand Contable de Montmorency called the Duc de Guise Monseigneur as he would the King, ending his letter with Your very humble servant. Guise, Grand Master of the King's household, replied Monsieur le Connetable, and signed as he did for the Parliament your very good friend as for the cardinal called the transalpine pope and his holiness by estienne he had the whole monastic church of france on his side and treated the holy father as an equal vain of his eloquence and one of the greatest theologians of his time he kept incessant watch over france and italy by means of three religious orders who were absolutely devoted to him toiling day and night in his service and serving him as spies and counsellors these few words will explain to what heights of power the duke and the cardinal had attained in spite of their wealth and the enormous revenues of their several offices they were so personally disinterested so eagerly carried away on the current of their statesmanship and so generous at heart that they were always in debt doubtless after the manner of caesar when Henri the third caused the death of the second balafre whose life was a menace to him the house of guise was necessarily ruined the costs of endeavouring to seize the crown during a whole century will explain the lowered position of this great house during the reigns of Louis the Thirteenth and Louis the Fourteenth, when the sudden death of Madame told all Europe the infamous part which the Chevalier de Lorraine had debased himself to play. Calling themselves the heirs of the dispossessed, Carolovingians, the Duke and Cardinal acted with the utmost insolence towards Catherine de' Medici, the mother-in-law of their niece. The Duchess de Guise spared her no mortification. This Duchess was a death day, and Catherine was a Medici, the daughter of upstart Florentine merchants, whom the sovereigns of Europe had never yet admitted into their royal fraternity. Francois I himself has always considered his son's marriage with the Medici as a mesalliance, and only consented to it under the expectation that his second son would never be Dauphin. Hence his fury when his eldest son was poisoned by the Florentine Montecuccioli. Destes refused to recognize the Medici as Italian princes. 
Those former merchants were in fact trying to solve the impossible problem of maintaining a throne in the midst of republican institutions. The title of Grand Duke was only granted very tardily by Philip II, King of Spain, to reward those Medici who bought it by betraying France their benefactress and severely attaching themselves to the court of Spain, which was at the time covertly counteracting them in Italy. Flatter none but your enemies. The famous saying of Catherine de' Medici seems to have been the political rule of life with that family of merchant princes in which great men were never lacking until their destinies became great, when they fell, before their time, into that degeneracy in which royal races and noble families are wont to end. For three generations there had been a great Lorrain warrior and a great Lorrain churchman, and what is more singular, the churchmen all bore a strong resemblance in the face to Jimenez, as did Cardinal Richelieu in after days. These five great cardinals all had sly, mean, and yet terrible faces, while the warriors, on the other hand, were of that type of Basque mountaineer which we see in Henri the Fourth. The two Balafres, father and son, wounded and scarred in the same manner, lost something of this type, but not the grace and affability by which, as much as by their bravery, they won the hearts of the soldiery. It is not useless to relate how the present Grand Master received his wound, for it was healed by the heroic measures of a personage of our drama, by Ambroise Paré, the man we have already mentioned as under obligations to Lecamon, syndic of the Guild Furies. At the siege of Calais, the Duke had his face pierced through and through by a lance, the point of which, after entering the cheek just below the right eye, went through to the neck below the left eye, and remained broken off in the face. The duke lay dying in his tent in the midst of universal distress, and he would have died had it not been for the devotion and prompt courage of Ambroise Poiret. The duke is not dead, gentlemen, he said to the weeping attendants, but he will soon die if I dare not treat him as I would a dead man, and I shall risk doing so, no matter what it may cost me in the end. See. And with that he put his left foot on the duke's breast, took the broken wooden end of the lance in his fingers, shook and loosened it by degrees in the wound, and finally succeeded in drawing out the iron head, as if he were handling a thing, not a man. Though he saved the prince by this heroic treatment, he could not prevent the horrible scar which gave the great soldier his nickname, the Balafre, the Scarred. This name descended to the sun, and for a similar reason. Absolutely masters of Francois II, whom his wife ruled through their mutual and excessive passion, these two great Lorrain princes, the Duke and the Cardinal, were masters of France, and had no other enemy at court than Catherine de' Medici. No great statesman ever played a closer or more watchful game. The mutual position of the ambitious widow of Henri II and the ambitious house of Lorrain was pictured, as it were, to the eye, by a scene which took place on the terrace of the Chateau de Blois very early in the morning of the day on which Christophe Lecamou was destined to arrive there. The Queen Mother, who feigned an extreme attachment to the Guises, had asked to be informed of the news brought by the three seigneurs coming from three different parts of the kingdom. But she had the mortification of being courteously dismissed by the cardinal. She then walked to the parterres, which overhung the Loire, where she was building, under the superintendence of her astrologer, Ruggieri, an observatory, which is still standing, and from which the eye may range over the whole landscape of that delightful valley. The two Lorrain princes were at the other end of the terrace, facing the Vendemois, which overlooks the upper part of the town, the perch of the Breton, and the postern gate of the chateau. Catherine had deceived the two brothers by pretending to a slight displeasure, for she was in reality very well pleased to have an opportunity to speak to one of the three young men who had arrived in such haste. This was a young nobleman named Chivany, apparently a tool of the cardinal, in reality a devoted servant of Catherine. Catherine also counted among her devoted servants two Florentine nobles, the Gondi, but they were so suspected by the Guises that she dared not send them on any errand away from the court, where she kept them watched, it is true, in all their words and actions, but where at least they were able to watch and study the Guises and counsel Catherine. These two Florentines maintained in the interests of the Queen Mother another Italian, Bidago, a clever Piedmontese, who pretended, with Giverni, to have abandoned their mistress and gone over to the Guises, who encouraged their enterprises and employed them to watch Catherine. Caverny had come from Paris and Ecouen. The last to arrive was saint andre who was Marshal of France, and became so important that the Guises, whose creature he was, made him the third person in the triumvirate they formed the following year against Catherine. 
The other seigneur who had arrived during the night was Villeville, also a creature of the Guises, and a marshal of France, who was returning from a secret mission known only to the Grand Master, who had entrusted it to him. As for Saint Andre, he was in charge of military measures, taken with the object of driving all reformers under arms into Amboise, a scheme which now formed the subject of a council held by the Duke and Cardinal, Birago, Kiverni, Villeville, and Saint Andre. As the two Lorrains employed Birago, it is to be supposed that they relied upon their own powers, for they knew of his attachment to the Queen Mother. At this singular epoch, the double part played by many of the political men of the day was well known to both parties. They were like cards in the hands of gamblers. The cleverest player won the game. During this council, the two brothers maintained the most impenetrable reserve. The conversation which now took place between Catherine and certain of her friends will explain the object of this council, held by the Guises in the open air, in the hanging gardens, at break of day, as if they feared to speak within the walls of the Chateau de Blois. The Queen Mother, under pretense of examining the observatory then in process of construction, walked in that direction, accompanied by the two Gondis, glancing with a suspicious and inquisitive eye at the group of enemies who were still standing at the further end of the terrace, and from whom Kiverni now detached himself to join the Queen Mother. She was then at the corner of the terrace, which looked down upon the church of St. Nicholas. There, at least, would be no danger of the slightest overhearing. The wall of the terrace is on a level with the towers of the church, and the Guises invariably held their council at the farther corner of the same terrace, at the base of the great unfinished keep or dungeon, going and returning between the Pochoir de Breton and the gallery by the bridge which joined them to the gardens. No one was within sight. Kiverni raised the hand of the Queen Mother to kiss it, and as he did so he slipped a little note from his hand to hers, without being observed by the two Italians. Catherine turned to the angle of the parapet and read as follows. You are powerful enough to hold the balance between the leaders and to force them into a struggle as to who shall serve you. Your house is full of kings and you have nothing to fear from the Lorrain. All the Bourbons, provided you pit them one against the other, for both are striving to snatch the crown from your children. Be the mistress and not the servant of your counsellors. Support them in turn one against the other or the kingdom will go from bad to worse and mighty wars may come of it but without the queen put the letter in the hollow of her corset resolving to burn it as soon as she was alone when did you see him she asked kiverni on my way back from visiting the connetable at Malone, where i met him with the duchess de berry whom he was most impatient to convey to savoy that he might return here and open the eyes of the chancellor olivier who is now completely duped by the Lorrains. As soon as Monsieur L'Hôpital saw the true object of the Guises, he determined to support your interests. That is why he is so anxious to get here and give you his vote at the councils. Is he sincere? asked Catherine. You know very well that if the Lorrain have put him in the council, it is that he may help them to reign. L'Hôpital is a Frenchman who comes off too good a stock not to be honest and sincere, said Giverny. Besides, his note is a sufficiently strong pledge. What answer did the Connetable send to the Guises? He replied that he was the servant of the king and would await his orders. On receiving that answer, the cardinal, to suppress all resistance, determined to propose the appointment of his brother as lieutenant general of the kingdom. Have they got as far as that? exclaimed Catherine, alarmed. Well, did Monsieur L'Hôpital send me no other message? He told me to say to you, madame, that you alone could stand between the crown and the Guises. Does he think that I ought to use the Huguenot as a weapon? Ah, madame, cried Kiverny, surprised at such astuteness. We never dreamed of casting you into such difficulties. Does he know the position I am in? asked the queen calmly. Very nearly. He thinks you were duped after the death of the king into accepting that castle on Madame Diane's overthrow. The Guises consider themselves released toward the queen by having satisfied the woman. Yes said the queen, looking at the two Gondi. I made a blunder. A blunder of the gods, replied Charles de Gondi. Gentlemen, said Catherine, if I go over openly to the reformers, I shall become the slave of a party. Madame, said Kiverny eagerly, I approve entirely of your meaning. You must use them, but not serve them. Though your support does undoubtedly, for the time being, lie there, 
said charles de gondy we must not conceal from ourselves that success and defeat are both equally perilous i know it said the queen a single false step would be a pretext on which the guises would seize at once to get rid of me the niece of a pope the mother of four valois a queen of france the widow of the most ardent persecutor of the huguenots an italian catholic the aunt of leo x can she ally herself with the reformation asked charles de gondy but said his brother albert if she seconds the guises does she not play into the hands of a usurpation we have to do with men who see a crown to seize in the coming struggle between catholicism and reform it is possible to support the reformers without abjuring reflect madame that your family which ought to have been wholly devoted to the king of france is at this moment the servant of the king of spain and to-morrow it will be that of the reformation if the reformation could make a king of the duke of florence i am certainly disposed to lend a hand for a time to the huguenots said catherine if only to revenge myself on that soldier and that priest and that woman as she spoke she called attention with her subtle italian glance to the duke and cardinal and then to the second floor of the chateau on which were the apartments of her son and mary stuart that trio has taken from my hands the reins of state for which i waited long while the old woman filled my place she said gloomily glancing toward chenonceau the chateau she had lately exchanged with diane de poitiers against that of chaumont ma she added in italian it seems that these reforming gentry in geneva have not the wit to address themselves to me and on my conscience i cannot go to them not one of you would dare to risk carrying them a message she stamped her foot i did hope you would have met the cripple at ecouen he has sense she said to Giovanni. the prince de conde was there madame said Giovanni, but he could not persuade the connetable to join him monsieur de montmorency wants to overthrow the guises who have sent him into exile but he will not encourage heresy what will ever break these individual wills which are forever thwarting royalty god's truth exclaimed the queen the great nobles must be made to destroy each other as louis the eleventh the greatest of your kings did with those of his time there are four or five parties now in this kingdom and the weakest of them is that of my children the reformation is an idea said charles de gondy the parties that louis the eleventh crushed were moved by self-interests only ideas are behind selfish interests replied Giovanni. under louis the eleventh the idea was the great fiefs make heresy an axe said albert de gondy and you will escape the odium of executions ah cried the queen but i am ignorant of the strength and also the plans of the reformers and i have no safe way of communicating with them if i were detected in any manoeuvre of that kind either by the queen who watches me like an infant in a cradle or by those two jailers over there i should be banished from france and sent back to florence with a terrible escort commanded by guise minions thank you no my daughter-in-law but i wish you the fate of being a prisoner in your own home that you may know that you have made me suffer their plans exclaimed Giovanni. the duke and the cardinal know what they are but those two foxes will not divorce them if you could induce them to do so madame i would sacrifice myself for your sake and come to an understanding with the prince de conte how much of the guises own plans have they been forced to reveal to you asked the queen with a glance at the two brothers monsieur de villeville and monsieur de saint andre have just received fresh orders the nature of which is concealed from us but i think the duke is intending to concentrate his best troops on the left bank within a few days you will all be moved to amboise the duke has been studying the position from this terrace and decides that blois is not a propitious spot for his secret schemes what can he want better added Cavini, pointing to the precipices which surrounded the chateau there is no place in the world where the court is more secure from attack than it is here abdicate or reign said albert in a low voice to the queen who stood motionless and thoughtful a terrible expression of inward rage passed over the fine ivory face of catherine de medici who was not yet forty years old though she had lived for twenty-six years at the court of france without power she who from the moment of her arrival intended to play a leading part then in her native language the language of dante 
these terrible words came slowly from her lips. Nothing, so long as that son lives, his little wife bewitches him, she added after a pause. Catherine's exclamation was inspired by a prophecy which had been made to her a few days earlier at the Chateau de Chaumont on the opposite bank of the river, where she had been taken by Ruggieri, her astrologer, to obtain information as to the lives of her four children from a celebrated female seer, secretly brought there by Nostradamus, chief among the physicians of that great sixteenth century, who practised, like the Ruggieri, the Cardans, Paracelsus, and others, the occult sciences. This woman, whose name and life have eluded history, foretold one year as the length of Francois's reign. "'Give me your opinion on all this,' said Catherine to Giverny. "'We shall have a battle,' replied the prudent courtier. "'The King of Navarre.' "'Oh, say the Queen!' interrupted Catherine. "'True, the Queen,' said Giverny, smiling. "'The Queen has given the Prince de Conde as leader to the reformers, and he in his position of youngest son can venture all. Consequently, the cardinal talks of ordering him here. If he comes, said the queen, I am saved. Thus the leaders of the great movement of the Reformation of France were justified in hoping for an ally in Catherine de' Medici. There is one thing to be considered, said the queen. The Bourbons may fool the Hugon Huguenots, and the Sears Cavin and de Bez may fool the Bourbons, but are we strong enough to fool the Huguenots, Bourbons, and Guises? In presence of three such enemies, it is allowable to feel one's pulse. But they have not the king, said Albert de Gondi. You will always triumph, having the king on your side. Maladetta Maria, muttered Catherine between her teeth. The Lorrains are even now endeavouring to turn the burghers against you, remarked Pirago. End of section six.